Good morning, and welcome to the YouTube version of the worship service for United Methodist Church of Nokomis on this second day of May in the year 2021. We're glad you're with us this morning. We would like to uh, wish happy birthday this week to Dell Barnes, Joanne Bauman, and Luke Eisenbarth. Roger and Gail Cole have an anniversary this week. Love one another, my friends, for God is love in us. Because God is love in us, love even the stranger well. Love sister and brother and child, for God is love in us. And my friends, for because God is love in us, love one another. Let us pray. God of love, plant us in the soil of your grace. Nurture us with <clears throat> the strength of Christ, the vine of everlasting life. Enlighten us with the wisdom of your spirit, which flows through us today and all days. Abide in us, God, that we may abide in you and live in your love. In your holy name we pray. Amen. We appreciate the ways that you have been faithful in your stewardship and your giving, especially your financial giving. We encourage you to send your checks to Post Office Box 156, United Methodist Church of Nokomis, Post Office Box 156, Nokomis, Illinois, 6 Two zero seven five. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose love is beyond understanding, whose mercy is beyond comprehension, we lift up our hearts to you in prayer. Though we were captives of your sinful and rebellious ways, your love has released us. You have freed us from experience. You have freed us to experience divine love in our own lives. Your atoning love has freed us from the penalty of sin, which was rightfully ours to pay. How can we express our thanksgiving except to praise your name and allow your love to be seen and to flow through us to others? Grant to us a determined faith and a fervent love that we might be reflections of your divine grace. And God, we ask you to be with those who we silently name in our hearts who need your loving grace and healing spirit. Hear our prayers, O Lord, as we offer our petitions in the name of the one who is love, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're staying in the book of 1 John today. We're in the fourth chapter, verses 7 through 21. <clears throat> Dear friends, let us love each other because love is from God and everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. The person who doesn't love does not know God because God is love. This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God has sent his only son into the world that we can live through him. This is love. It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the sacrifice that deals with our sins. Dear friends, if God loves us this way, we also ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. If we love each other, God remains in us and his love is made perfect in us. This is how we know we remain in him and he remains in us because he has given us a measure of his spirit. We have seen him, we have seen and testify 
that the Father has sent the Son to be Savior of the world. If any of us confess that Jesus is God's Son, God remains in us and we remain in God. If we have known and have believed the love that God has for us, if we have known and believed that the love God has for us, God is love and those who remain <clears throat> those who remain in love remain in God and God remains in them. This is how love has been perfected in us so that we can have confidence on the judgment day because we are exactly the same as God is in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear expects punishment. The person who is afraid has not been made perfect in love. We love because God first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates a brother or sister, he is a liar because the person who doesn't love a brother or sister who can, who can be seen can't love God who can't be seen. This commandment we have from him, those who claim to love God ought to love their brother and sister also. These words are from God for God's people. Thanks be to God. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Pray with me, please. <clears throat> God, we are prepared to hear your word after we have heard, read from your word. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Cut to the chase. You've heard that phrase before, cut to the chase. Now let's say, Sing goes back a um, hundred years, back to the first movies that were made in the 1920s. It refers to moving from a dramatic scene to a action scene, like a car chase. It means get to the point. There are times in life when we want to say, cut to the chase, aren't there? I'm sure there are times when you've heard me talking perhaps even preaching, when you want to say, Pastor Mark, what's your point? When a story has gone on too long, uh, like a sermon, when it seems like we're dealing with peripheral matters that don't, mat that don't mean anything, we have no time to waste. We want to say, cut to the chase, get to the point. My kids are fond of saying, Dad, after they've heard me try to explain something to them, Dad, we know how to make the watch, but we don't know what time it is yet. Sometimes we're under such pressure and need desperately to know some answers and get some help that we know we don't have time or energy to wade through a lot of trivialities. You know that feeling? We're facing a crisis and we want help. We've received a diagnosis about our health or someone else's health and suddenly a lot of issues we thought were important aren't important any longer. We face some decisions that will affect our lives radically. Life has gotten down to basics for us in some way and we feel we don't have time left for anything but getting to the point. This passage, this passage that we just heard is the point. It's the chase. Now I want to tell you a little personal story about this passage. It was many years ago um, when I was, the first time I was trying to get a bachelor or a, a master's degree in counseling back in the 1990s, another century. And um, I was working on a theory, um, not my own theory, but a theory that I had heard. And there's some things about me that, that I made me, led me to believe this, that Everything we do, all of our actions are motivated 
by either love or fear. I'm not going to get into the depth of that right now, but I wasn't considering the pastoral ministry yet. I was uh, working at a a secular job in in a for-profit area, and um, I was active in church, and I was doing some, some lay speaking and uh, participating in Bible studies, and, and I was on a discipleship process, reading the Bible and that sort of thing. And then I came across this passage. I'm not even sure how I came across this passage. I might have been reading through different books of the Bible, but, but somehow I came across this passage, and this is verse 18 in the fourth chapter of 1 John. We heard it this morning. There is no fear in love but perfect love drives out fear because fear expects punishment. Like I said, I'm not going to go into too much depth there, but no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. So as someone who was considering the relationship of fear and love and how that motivates our behavior, I really, I really attached, and ever since then, this has been a central passage to, to my theology. Get to the point, the chase, the focus of so much of what we want to know about life and how life is to be lived. Here's what it tells us about what we might call the heart of it all. This passage tells, this, this passage of, of 1 John 4, verses 7 through 21, tells us what the bedrock of life is like when it tells us what God is like. What does it say? We we talked about this last Sunday as well. What does it say? God is love. Maybe you've never wondered about this, but many have. Many have wondered whether there is indeed a God and and what God is like. It makes all the difference whether whether there is truly a God or whether we're all alone, completely alone, living an essentially meaningless existence that is going nowhere with that little hyphen between the date of our birth and the date of our death all there is. It matters too what this God is like. Is God distant and uncaring, ignoring us? Is God distant and unable with to help with no strength to enter our lives? Is God mean and out to get us? Those three little words, nine letters, nine letters, three little words, God is love, gets to the heart of it all. They cut to the chase. They tell us that God is pure, self-giving love. God cares. Indeed, God cares deeply. What a reality to build a life on. We are not alone, neglected, orphaned. God is love. How do we know this? Of course, it's a matter of faith, but the reality to which God, to which the writer of 1 John points is that God sent his only son into the world. God keeps his distance from us. Any parent knows how precious his or her children are. God's sending his son shows us unmistakably how much God loves us. There's more, of course. God sent his son to rescue us from the mess we are in, although much of it is our own fault. How do we know that God loves us and that this little statement, nine words, God is love, is not just syrupy sentiment, a deep-seated wish or a figment of someone's imagination? Here, too, we are at the heart of it all. God in Christ has entered into our experience, our drudgery, our crisis, our need. 
Have you ever flown directly over your home community, the place where your family lives? As others looked out the airplane windows, perhaps they could make out roads and see dots of houses. You, however, saw that and more. You saw places familiar to you and knew that people who loved you and whom you loved lived there. You had an attachment to that place that others on the plane didn't have. You'd been there. Well, God's been here. In God's spirit, God, this God who is love, is here, right where you and I live. God has sent his son and given us of his spirit. The God who love, is love did that for us. So how does this affect our lives? All of life is changed when we live on the basis that God is love. Living on the bedrock belief that God is love helps us cut to the chase. The heart of it all is knowing, truly knowing that God gives us confidence. No longer do we need to be afraid or uncertain about facing life or death. We can count on the reality that God is love. God's been here, right here, right where we wonder about life, face threats and hardships, and worry about what might happen, has happened, or is happening. We can count on God who is love. This great truth affects our lives in yet another way. You see, if God is love and indeed loves us, then that has to affect our relationships with our fellow human beings. How can we ignore our fellow human beings if we know and worship a God like this, a God who is love? How can we harm our fellow human beings if we know and worship a God like this, a God who is love? How can we fear our fellow human beings or anything else if we have confidence in a God like this, a God who is love? Indeed, indeed since we serve a God who has structured the universe so that love is what is most important, our only proper response is to live with love ourselves and love other people just as God has loved us. To love a God who is love means that we must love our brothers and sisters, all our fellow human beings also. That's the heart of it all. God has also shown his love to us through the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have, an ongoing, we have ongoing evidence of God's love in our lives through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Just as a wedding ring on the finger is a constant reminder of the love of a husband or wife, so the continuing presence of God's Spirit within us is a reminder of God's love for each one of us. <clears throat> the implication of God's amazing love is clear. Since God loved us so much, we ought to love one another. If we have experienced God's love through Christ, if we continue to experience God's love through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, we are compelled to become instruments of God's love to others. Just as metal conducts electricity, we are to be conductors of divine love, allowing it to pass through us and touch a lost and hurting world. God's love has really come to dwell in us. It makes a transforming difference. It is impossible to be a repository of divine love and at the same time be motivated by hatred for others. Love and hatred are like oil and water. They do not mix. God's love is present. There is no room for hatred or bitterness. 
Have you experienced God's love in your own life? I hope you have. I hope you will. And I hope it's an ongoing experience. As you yield your life to Christ's saving love, you will come to understand an authentic love as you have never known it before. And that love will transform you. One of the ways that we experience the love of God is through the means of grace. And one of those most important means of grace for us is Holy Communion that we celebrate. that we celebrate on the first Sunday of every month. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. All who come to me shall not hunger and all who believe in me shall not thirst. When Christians around the world and throughout the centuries, we gather around these symbols of bread and, and wine, grape and grain, simple elements that speak of nourishment and transformation. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you are as close as us to us as breath, that your love is constant and unfailing. We thank you for all that sustains life and especially for Jesus Christ who teaches us how to live out an ethic of justice and peace and for the promise of transformation may manifest in his life, death, and resurrection. We ask you to bless this bread and this cup. Through this meal, make us the body of Christ, that we may join with you in promoting the well-being of all creation. Amen. We remember on the night when Jesus and the disciples had their last meal together, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat it as often as you do it, remembering me. In the symbol of the broken bread, we participate in the life of Christ, and dedicate ourselves to being Christ's disciples. In the same way, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you. This cup is a new covenant poured out for you and for many. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In the symbol of this cup, the cup of love, we participate in the new life Christ brings. We give thanks, loving God, that you have refreshed us at your table. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another. As we have been fed by the seed that became grain and then became bread, May we go out into the world to plant seeds of justice, transformation, and hope. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us say the prayer that Christ taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Cut to the chase, God's love. That's what it's all about. That is the point of it all, God's love through Jesus Christ. 
You may meet people this week who don't know what love is, who don't know what it feels like to be loved, who've never heard of Jesus Christ and don't know about God. Be ready to share Christ's love with those people. Be ready to share that with all that you meet. And so now in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace, the peace of Christ, taking the light of God with you. In Jesus' name.